Brilliant. Hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Sylvia Levy, and I'm the Communications Officer for the ANH Academy and the Amana Program, based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us today on this webinar, co-hosted by the ANH Academy and Ag Tanute, on the environmental and health impacts of diets the second in our webinar series about findings from the UN State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World Report, also known as the SOFI 2020 Report. I hope most of you know about the ANH Academy and our Academy members, but in case you're not, the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Health Academy brings together researchers, practitioners, and policymakers working for better nutrition and health through improved agriculture and food systems. With members from over 100 countries, the ANH Academy is a global network and platform for sharing research and evidence, capacity strengthening, and collaboration across diverse disciplines. If you're not a member yet, we encourage you to sign up and join the Academy on our website after this webinar. It's completely free to join. As well as convening technical working groups, hosting webinars like this one, and curating a blog, we also have an annual meeting of the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Health community called the ANH Academy Week. We held this year's conference, ANH 2020, just a month ago online, and we invite you to explore our conference resources, oral and poster presentation videos, and recordings of all of the live sessions on our website. We're thrilled to be hosting this webinar mini series with our friends and colleagues at the Agriculture to Nutrition Community of Practice, also known as Ag to Nuke. You can also find information about our recent joint webinars on the ANH Academy website. One more announcement before a few housekeeping reminders. On Tuesday, the 11th of August, please join us for the second webinar in a different series we have about social and behavior change, co-hosted by GIZ, and specifically about how to understand the barriers and motivators to behavior change. We'll share the link to register in the chat box and through email following this webinar. Finally, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few technical items so you all know how to participate today. First, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website. All participants have been muted, but please do introduce yourselves using the chat box. Let us know your name, where you're joining us from, and the organization you work with. Please also feel free to rename yourself in the Zoom call with the name you'd like people to use. You can also note which organization you work with and where you currently are, like I have. You can access the chat box by clicking the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Later in the session, we'll open up the conversation with a question and answer session. If you have questions, we invite you to share them in the chat box throughout the session. You can send your questions at any time and we'll do our best to raise them during the Q&A. If we have time, we may also ask you to raise your hands so that you have um, the ability to ask your question using the audio function. If at any point you experience technical issues, please check your audio settings and your internet connection. If you get lost, please try to reconnect to the webinar using the same link. That is it from me for now. Thank you, and over to you, Anna. Thanks for the introduction, Sylvia, and thank you to ANH Academy for hosting this webinar. Uh, my name is Anna Herforth. I am a co-leader of the Agdenut Community of Practice, uh, along with Cecilia Gonzalez, who's on the call, and Emily Lovett-Rupert as well. And um, it's really wonderful to partner uh, with ANH Academy for this uh, mini-series on the UN State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World report. Um, this was a really important publication for our communities this year because it's linking, it is linking food systems, agriculture, and nutrition and understanding what are some of the bottlenecks between agriculture and nutrition as well as some of the opportunities. Uh, what's the status right now? Um, and where, where can food systems be improved with the data that's shown in this report. So last week in the start of the mini series, we discussed uh, one piece of the report, which is the work that I led with a team at Tufts, uh, including Yan Bai and Will Masters, 
uh, and others, and we shared the um, results regarding the affordability and cost of nutritious diets uh, around the world. So you can find um, you can find the uh, webinar resources for part one, which I'll post here in the chat box in a moment. And today, now we have part two, um, which is another section that was very rich in the, uh, in the SOFI 2020 report, which was written uh, by Marco Springman, who's here to share the findings about the environmental and health impacts of diet. So in the report, sort of we have these two pieces of where um, we had estimated what is the minimum cost of a healthy diet and is that accessible? And then Marco looked at what are some of the hidden environmental and health costs of current diets and where, uh, how does that need to be shifted so that what we as humans consume on the planet is more environmentally sustainable, and more sustainable for our own health and well-being, um, and how can food systems adjust to support uh, positive environmental health and health impacts from what we consume. Uh, so Marco will tell us about that today. I'm very pleased to be able to share this with the community and that, that Marco was willing to um, do this presentation. And then we have uh, Joyce Kinabo, who is uh, a professor at Sokoina University of Agriculture in Tanzania and has uh, spent her career working on uh, nutrition embedded within food systems, particularly in Africa, um, not just in Tanzania, but she has worked in many countries in Africa um, and is currently leading an effort to uh, develop dietary guidelines across several countries in Africa. So she will uh, be reflecting on some of the results that uh, Marco shares and that were presented within the SOFI 2020 and what that implies for African food systems. So um, with, I will put a couple of links in the chat box to, to the uh, SOFI report itself and the um, webinar we had last week. And now let's, uh, let's move ahead and um, I will pass it over to Dr. Marco Springman, a senior researcher on environmental sustainability and public health at the University of Oxford. Thank you so much, Marco, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining this, uh, what will hopefully be an interesting session for you. Um, I'm just going to share my slides here. Let's see that um, that works. Does everybody see my slides? Okay, I see thumbs up, so I'll just go ahead. Um, and I already provided a good introduction to the talk, and it will be about the things that are not currently valued very much in the food system, but that might anyhow be fairly important. One of the things um, immediately that we think about when we think about diets, uh, uh, or maybe some of us do at least, uh, are the health implications. And uh, they can really be quite, um, quite substantial. Globally and in most regions, imbalanced diets are the number one risk factor for mortality. Um, and those imbalanced diets may, are diets that are too low in fruits and vegetables, too low in nuts, too low in legumes, too high in red and processed meat, and things like that. At the same time, we know that we are living through an obesity pandemic and indeed the global prevalence of overweight increased over a third over the last year and obesity rates even doubled. When we look at the environmental implications, uh, it doesn't look any rosier either. Uh, food systems and the, the diets that we have are a major driver of climate change. Um, up to a third of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions, according to the latest IPCC estimates. We also know that food systems are a major driver of land use change and biodiversity loss. Uh, one of the major users of, uh, uses of uh, fresh water with 70% of global fresh water withdrawals. And uh, the food system is also a major polluter of uh, uh, terrestrial and aquatic systems. For example, through 
uh, fertilizer runoff that comes from uh, too much uh, uh, application of fertilizers, which already has resulted in a couple of hundred dead zones in oceans where uh, all fish basically die. Um, we estimated that if we don't change course, then those environmental impacts might increase by 50 to 90% by the year 2050. And only if dietary changes, changes in agricultural management, uh, reductions in food loss and waste, and changes in technology come together, are we able to really stay within those, uh, within those systems? Um, it's always easy to say those things, but how can we actually make that happen, right? Um, especially if we don't see those environmental impacts or the health impacts. Um, nonetheless, they impose costs on society. If we think about uh, unhealthy diets, then those clearly are related to healthcare related costs, um, to lost work when, when people are sick, uh, and also just a loss of quality of life. Um, the unsustainability of diets and food systems result in climate change costs when you have, for example, extreme weather events like uh, wildfires, if you think about the last few, few years, yield losses uh, as well, uh, greater spread of, uh, of uh, vector-borne diseases. Um, you have other environmental degradation when you think about water, water use and cleanup costs, for example, uh, that, uh, that are a cost item. Um, and, you know, if it comes uh, uh, very thick, then um, we might have loss of complete ecosystems. If you think about uh, large scale deforestation in the Amazon and how that impacts tropical rainforests. So there are clearly uh, a lot of cost factors. A um, couple of years ago in 2016, we tried to put sort of some value on, on uh, at least the climate change costs and the health costs to see uh, what the approx approximate scale of those were. And we found indeed that uh, there might be up to a couple of trillion US dollars by the year 2050. So for this year's SOFI report, uh, we were asked to update that analysis and look at a greater range of dietary scenarios, but also um, update the evidence base somewhat. So um, that's what we did. Uh, in terms of diet scenarios, we now looked at the standardized set of healthy and sustainable diet scenarios that were developed by the Eat Lancet Commission on healthy diets from sustainable food systems. And they included uh, the standard flexitarian diet, a very low to moderate, uh, uh, a diet that is low to moderate uh, in animal source foods. But um, uh, it also included um, pescatarian diets that are based uh, more on fish, vegetarian diets, uh, and vegan diets. And for each of those more specialized diets, we looked at different classifications of those. Because if you substitute, um, let's say, meat in an average diet, then usually people don't substitute it one-to-one with, -one with, let's say, just legumes or so. So what observational studies seem to show us is that people choose a variety of food groups and we therefore we specified two sets of those more specialized diets one where um, uh, meat or other animal source foods are substituted replaced with um, a mix of legumes and fruits and veg and one where they are re replaced by a mix of legumes and whole grains both of those should be relatively healthy but because of changes in uh, because those food groups have different price points it might matter a great deal for the affordability of those diets. Um, then we ran um, those different diet scenarios through a health analysis, um, through an environmental analysis, and then through an economic valuation uh, of those. Um, in the health analysis, we used a standard comparative risk assessment that is something similar that the global burden of disease uses. In the environmental analysis, we used life cycle uh, uh, meta-analysis of life cycle analyses that tell us what are the carbon footprints uh, of different foods. And in the economic uh, evaluation, we, we used uh, two different methods. So for valuing the climate change costs, we use something that is called the social cost of carbon. Here we used an updated estimate that looked at what is actually the cost of climate change mitigation if we want to fulfill the Paris climate agreement and have uh, and uh, curtail global warming to uh, less than two degrees. Um, and that is just paired with emissions from the food system. And then the health costs we evaluate by so-called cost of illness estimate, uh, estimates that tell us what are the costs of treating, for example, um, 
a, a stroke case, a coronary heart disease case, a cancer case, and that we paired with the outcomes of the health analysis. Um, so let me, with that, jump right in. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise them in the chat, then we can pick them up in the discussion round. So here see a snapshot of the health analysis. Um, and what you see here is that adoption of those different dietary patterns, starting from flexitarian diets, um, uh, uh, over pescatarian, vegetarian, vegan, um, in the high veg uh, classification, and then the same one with the high grain classification, could result in reductions, of, uh, reductions in mortality of uh, around 12.5 um, million people in 2030. And you see here why that is, right? So let's pick out the one that globally has uh, results in the largest reduction of uh, uh, disease cases and mortality from those diseases. That's the high veg vegan scenario right in the middle. Um, there you see, if we start from the top, a lot of it is due to a greater consumption of vegetables, fruits, nuts, legumes, a lot uh, due to whole grains, then uh, further due to reduction in red and processed meat. Those are the red bars. Um, and then uh, uh, the rest, the other third is due to a um, um, improvement in uh, weight levels where you have no underweight, no overweight and no obesity. Um, those are population average estimates. So obviously for a person you can't simultaneously reduce underweight or, and obesity so you would be either or um uh, so you see this is basically a summary of what happens in a in a population you have a small reduction uh, increase you could have a small increase in mortality due to less fish consumption in that scenario um that's a little bit debatable but we put it in there to be conservative but even with that you see that uh, on average that is the healthiest scenario here um, we wanted to compare current diets with what is indeed the healthiest. So, and that we did on a country level basis. So in each country, we looked at what is the healthiest scenario and uh, compared to what the healthy, healthiest scenario was, that might not always be the high veg vegan scenario. It can be another one. Um, we estimated that uh, 14 million uh, deaths uh, can be avoided due to dietary changes in the year 2030. And that's about 22% of all deaths among adults, uh, which is really substantial. Now, um, as I said, this we paired on a, a cause of death specific basis to those cost of illness estimates. And this is what we get out from that. Uh, approximately 1.3 trillion uh, US dollars um, in avoidable healthcare costs uh, in 2030. That is 7% of global healthcare expenditure. So. Uh, quite substantial, and you see here how that is distributed uh, not only across the cause of causes of death but also uh, cost items. So the direct cost would be, for example, in hospital costs or cost for uh, um, um, uh, for uh, uh, treatment and pharmaceuticals, and the indirect costs are cost of indirect care by relatives, which is a high cost item specifically in countries where the healthcare system is not very well developed. Uh, and another uh, bit is due to the indirect cost of lost labor, uh, which here uh, is the smallest one. Um, across countries, obviously that differs quite a bit because healthcare costs at the moment are highest, are very proportional to current healthcare spending. And that happens to be highest in high income countries, as you can imagine. So you see the biggest contribution to those global costs comes indeed from high income countries and relatively less so from uh, uh, middle, uh, well, actually also a big chunk, lower middle income countries, that's a population effect because most people live in that classification and only a very small cost item in low income countries because um, uh, the healthcare sp level of healthcare spending is just so low and still, pro even though it's projected to increase in the future, relatively it would still be very low. If we compare that across the different dietary patterns, as I said, um, each, in each country it always picks out what is, what is the difference to the healthiest, but because they, they are not always the same, you see here a slight difference, but uh, uh, you, you see here um, uh, positive uh, healthcare costs for all of those diets, 
but uh, on average, the high veg vegan one is the one with the lowest costs here. But also, as you see, the others are very low in comparison to current uh, or projected diets in 2030. Um, let's go over to the environmental costs. Here we paired uh, the food groups in every country with um, um, uh, region-specific uh, carbon footprints. And what we, you see here is that, uh, and we took into account uh, potential technological improvements in, uh, in agriculture uh, to the year 2030. And what you see here is we projected um, uh, globally eight, uh, a little bit over eight gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalents in 2030. Um, over three quarters of that is due to animal source foods, as you see here. The biggest chunk due to beef and lamb, followed by uh, milk or dairy products in general. Um, you probably have seen lots of those studies, but uh, you also see here that any of those other uh, more plant-based dietary patterns can reduce that, uh, those global greenhouse gas emissions by quite a bit. Um, the least ambitious is the flexitarian one because that still includes a fair bit of animal source foods, um, like um, one serving of red meat per week, uh, which I guess is not really that high, but still it results in, uh, in quite an um, quite emissions item here. The pescatarian and vegetarian ones reduce those emissions by about half and the vegan ones by about uh, three quarters. Um, and I should say here, one caveat of this is we didn't take into account land use emissions here. So therefore it's 13% uh, of total emissions. If you count land use emissions and processing of foods, you get up to uh, easily up to a quarter uh, and even to a third according to the latest estimates. Um, pairing this now with uh, um, with the social cost of carbon mitigation is probably a good way of saying it. So what needs to be the cost of those emissions to uh, basically achieve the climate stabilization target results in costs of those foods uh, or of, of those diets that reach up to 1.7 trillion in 2030. And as you can see here, um, the, those again have different, a different distribution across income countries in, uh, or countries sorted by income group with the biggest chunk of emissions and climate change costs due to lower middle income countries. That's again a population effect. If you look at it from a per capita perspective, then obviously high income countries and upper middle income countries have very high per cap per person emissions and low income countries the lowest. But um, nonetheless, you see here, there is large reduction potential with changes to those other dietary patterns. Uh, but a bit more heterogeneous than with the health costs. Then you probably ask yourself, well, what, um, how does that compare to sort of what, uh, uh, what diets cost, right? And last week you have seen um, estimates uh, uh, that are based on what uh, the prices of foods as people see in markets and supermarkets. We did here another um, comparison where we just took estimates of wholesale costs. Um, those are usually not the ones you see in supermarkets. In supermarkets, they would be quite a bit higher, but we thought it would be a good comparison anyway. And we had uh, country specific data on those uh, as well as uh, future projections uh, that would be sensitive to uh, income growth, but also change in dietary preferences. And what you see here, if you, for example, just look at the second set of bars, the global in 2030, those were the results we had looked at before. Then you see that compared to those wholesale, total wholesale costs, the costs of healthcare and climate change represent about a quarter of those. So if you put them together, we are at half of total wholesale costs. And if you go further to 2030, you could even be uh, at the cost, uh, at costs that are uh, comparable to the to to total whole uh, uh, wholesale costs, which is really quite a bit. Um, also here, it looks very different. If you look across income groups in high income country, countries, uh, already by 2030, the external costs would rival those uh, market-based costs. Whereas in low income countries, um, um, it would be uh, a little bit of a, a, a 
would be a substantial contribution in, already in 2030 and much more so in 2050. Uh, but here, the climate change costs would hit hardest uh, compared to the healthcare costs because, according to at least our projections, um, health expenditures and uh, cost of illness uh, wouldn't pick up as uh, as rapidly as uh, the climate change costs. Um, this is maybe more informative slide on the per day costs. Uh, again, evaluated at wholesale costs um, of uh, not only the uh, projected cost in 2030, but also the cost of all those different dietary patterns we have looked at. And what you see here, first of all, uh, looking at the global results, is that all dietary patterns, uh, uh, all of those healthier and uh, somewhat more sustainable dietary patterns, are uh, much lower in costs uh, on average uh, than the uh, current costs if those external costs of climate change and healthcare are included. That effect you see much higher in high income countries, also in middle income countries, also in lower income countries. And in low income countries, it becomes, uh, it's a little bit more of a challenge as you can see. So with including those costs in 2030, you see that um, uh, according to our estimates, only the high grain or higher grain plant-based diets would be uh, uh, relatively less in cost, whereas the others are still a bit higher. So that shows you that specifically in low-income countries, there uh, would still be challenges in having healthy and sustainable diets be relatively more affordable than current diets if all those external costs were to be included. Um, all of this has important policy implications, and I can only touch a little bit uh, uh, on those here, and maybe we can discuss more in the discussion section. Um, one of the clear findings is really that um, uh, the full costing of foods or of diets in general, I think, can provide quite a, a good argument for uh, adopting healthier and more sustainable diets because those uh, the cost of those increases relatively less than the cost of the current unhealthy uh, and unsustainable diets. What does that mean for policies? Well, uh, nobody likes to talk about taxes, but that is the obvious policy instrument here. Uh, one can think of tax approaches that, for example, tax foods according to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we did a study on that a couple of years ago, uh, published in Nature Climate Change, where we looked at different um, tax schemes um, and different ways of recycling using the subsidies to uh, rebate to, for example, low income households and to make sure that uh, they are not put at a loss. Uh, we evaluated uh, a couple of different, uh, uh, a large number of different tax schemes and I attached some supplementary slides here so you can look through that if you like. But we found that in every country, even in the low income countries that we had in the data set, there were always tax schemes that resulted in a uh, reduction in greenhouse gases and, a, and, in a health Im and in health improvements. We did something similar from a health perspective where we looked at uh, what should be a so-called optimal tax on red and processed uh, meat, given that those were declared as carcinogenic and likely carcinogenic by the World uh, Cancer Agency of the World Health Organization. Um, and also there we found large potential savings in healthcare costs, uh, co-benefits in terms of reduction in green, uh, green, uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and improvements in health. Um, what we found in those studies as well though is that those price incentives as such might not be enough to move the whole population to a different diet. I mean, just think about yourself. If you know something is cheaper, well, you might maybe buy it, but maybe you have strong taste or you're influenced by uh, whatever uh, taste at the moment your friends have, your family have. Um, so only price incentives are probably not enough. So what we think is that um, what could help in supporting adoption of more healthy and sustainable diets are reforms of national dietary guidelines. And two weeks ago, um, we published a paper on that where we looked at potential uh, reform options, but we also evaluate current national dietary guidelines and found that most are not up to scratch, apparent, uh, especially when considering sustainability aspects. Then um, school and workplace programs, procurement programs, and really progressive regulation of the food sector could help. 
uh, all of which I think pr uh, proper dietary guidelines can contribute to. And then the last one that is also um, um, probably very important for this community is that uh, when we talk about diets, we also need to always think about the production system at the same time. Uh, so it doesn't uh, um, help if only diets change, also the production of foods need to change. And there really a change in agricultural incentives like changes in subsidies uh, would be uh, would make uh, make a good step in the right direction, and we we are running through some analyses at the moment. So uh, stay tuned on that. Um, with that, I uh, probably talked already way too long. I open it up for I uh, I think Joyce is coming in with um, comments, and then we have a discussion round. And as I said, you can have more. Uh, um, more detailed descriptions in those in the bibliography and I attached uh, uh, a couple of supplementary slides where you can just run through some of the things that I just uh, mentioned in passing now. So thank you very much. Thank you Marco. Uh, thanks so much food for thought here uh, to consider in terms of understanding the these environmental and health costs of current diet, diets and who bears them and how to move in a better direction. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the dietary guidelines and that they don't currently often consider sustainability. Um, you know, I think it's important to mention that as you, your data showed, moving towards more recommended diets is incredibly helpful for reducing the um, burdens on health and the environment. Um, and then it could be reduced even more by uh, considering more carefully um, sustainability uh, and specific health targets. So Joyce, I would like you to comment, uh, invite you to, to come in and comment on what is the role of, uh, you know, within your work on dietary guidelines development within Africa, considering sustainability within that process, but then in the bigger picture, what, um, what needs to change or be supported in particularly African food systems in order to uh, produce a food environment that supports healthy and sustainable consumption? Um, Joyce, I see, yep, I see the uh, icon for you. I know, uh, just as I mentioned to everyone, um, the connection doesn't allow video connection for Joyce uh, Kinabo today, but we're hearing your sound earlier loud and clear. So over to you, Joyce. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you, Marco, for your excellent presentation. And uh, I hope I'll uh, be able to do justice to the comments. But to one important thing that I've um, picked up from your presentation is about this linkage between exposure to different types of diets and the health outcomes. And it has been very clear that if you eat a certain type of diet, obviously you should expect to have a certain outcome, uh, good or not good. But you also indicated about healthier scenario. Uh, that's good, but then it will depend on the starting point, whoever is adopting that healthier scenario. So um, again, in our kind of setting, the issue of data availability, I don't know, you have worked with a lot of data, but I'm not sure whether you were able to really pick some of the data that are uh, coming from this side of the globe. It's, uh, it's usually a challenge, but uh, I think you've done very well to really uh, bring out all those uh, uh, insights, all that insight and that those um, uh, perspectives as far as uh, health outcomes and diet are concerned. Uh, then let me go back and talk about the uh, food-based dietary guidelines. And these are, I don't know whether everybody is aware about food-based dietary guidelines. These are intended to establish a basis for public food and nutrition, health and agriculture policies and nutrition education programs. And basically to, fo to foster healthy eating habits and lifestyles. Now from what Marco has presented, I now believe that 
we have to redo our food-based dietary guidelines because there are quite a number of things that have to be uh, incorporated in the food-based dietary guidelines to really make sense to, uh, to whoever is using it. But the only challenge that I see in uh, food-based dietary guidelines is that, you know, it's taken as just a, a document like any other document that promotes our uh, consumption of certain foods. It's not something that is really embraced by governments and included in their agricultural programs or agricultural plans. Unless we do that, these food-based data guidelines will remain guidelines and no action out of those guidelines. So I, I think uh, to promote consumption together with agriculture programs or agriculture plans in countries, these food-based data guidelines must be embedded in the uh, agricultural system of given countries and much more to the food system. So the food system must respond to the guidelines or their guidelines must guide the food systems in those countries. Um, yes, we have food-based data guidelines, but my worry is that not much, many people in this world know about food-based data guidelines. Dissemination is usually very weak. We have weak dissemination of guidelines with translation, we don't have translation of these uh, guidelines into uh, various uh, dialects. So currently not many people are aware about food-based data guidelines and how to use it to maintain health. And um, I would guess because food-based data guidelines are based on food, as the name suggests, then obviously we, we see that it will be linked to agriculture. And we know in Africa, agriculture is the backbone of many economies. So embedding food-based data guidelines into the agriculture sector would make sense to really sensitize the agriculture sector to be nutrition sensitive or to follow what the guidelines are, are, are presenting. Uh, and let us admit that all diets are plant-based, whether we like it or not. Animals eat grass, it's a plant, to make the meat. But all the rest is plant. So food-based diet guidelines, I think, should, best, should be focused on our plant-based um, approach so that we benefit from the plants in cleaning the environment. So if we have more of that being produced, then invariably we'll be doing justice to the environment because the plants will be helping us to clean the, uh, the, in the environment. But then uh, I think guidelines, the way I see it, um, should also include penalties. You know, in guidelines we just make statements that are positive and uh, you know, for people to take action, but we don't present penalties as to if you do not do this. I know that's not the language that many people would like to hear, but if people are consuming unsustainable and healthy diets, then we need to make draconian measures. Prevalence of obesity, overweight, and uh, NCDs is pandemic, and nobody pays attention to it. I guess the link between COVID-19 and obesity overweight would probably act as a wake-up call. So we need to employ these measures to address the problem before it gets out of proportion. If it works to do that, I think we better do that. However, I think uh, Marco has already presented, we need the data package that will make all people healthy and not a question of increasing or decreasing um, certain foods. Personally, I do believe that all natural foods are healthy, but the question is how much should be consumed, which sometimes we don't tell people what to, how much to consume. And that probably is something that we need to work on it. But again, I think we need a balance and what balance between 
expenditure, especially of energy and intake. The concept of balance is disappearing from the world uh, nutrition and other uh, food uh, systems or whatever. We, we don't talk about balance. And this is what is costing us in terms of um, malnutrition and um, this pandemic, overweight and obesity pandemic. Uh, so food-based dietary guidelines are useful, but they need to be really looked into so that they respond to the current situation of food systems and uh, climate change and so that to make it a little bit uh, sustainable. Okay, uh, we'll get to food systems in Africa and what should be done. Uh, I guess uh, this is a huge word, food system. It's a, it's a complex network of activities uh, that involves a lot of things, uh, production, processing, transport, consumption, governance, economics, psychology, culture, tradition, all these are embedded in this. If you try to look at this system, then you have to tease out all these aspects and how they affect um, uh, our food uh, our food systems. So the, the, the impact of food on individuals and health, the way Mark presented, is determined by additional factors that sometimes we don't take into consideration. Even in the, the, the analysis that Mark has presented, the social, cultural, and uh, psychological factors are not brought into the picture. And these are some, uh, sometimes very, very important when it comes to decision making. Uh, as to what should be produced, what should be consumed, how it should be consumed. So there's limited understanding of these factors in the definition and description of food systems. So I think with what we have heard so far would be able to uh, include that. But we need to realize that uh, food system, yes, is a huge word, but it applies at all levels. The food systems, global level, national level, household level, and individual level. So each one has to see how their food system is influencing their health so that at the end of the day, we all act together to ensure that we are actually consuming healthy diets and keeping ourselves healthy. But what is the situation in Africa? Uh, the food system in African context is that it's a gloomy picture, but uh, I think I need to present this, <laughs> that uh, we have low diversity in production, uh, low pro labor productivity, limited investment in technology, limited nutrition consideration in food systems. So that's a, a big challenge in terms of uh, our food system in Africa. But also in terms of distribution, marketing, processing, uh, we have poor physical and poor artificial intelligence infrastructure when it comes to distribution, marketing, and processes. Uh, limited food industry capacity, uh, limited skills and knowledge on marketing, processing, and distribution, especially of traditional foods, which are still consumed by many people in this uh, continent. Then we have the environmental challenge that uh, has have been presented by Marco on food systems, but we need also to look at the impact of food systems on climate change and the impact of climate change on food systems. So these are things that go together in either direction. So we need to really see how is climate change impacting on our food systems when there's drought, when there's uh, the floods, or insects like this year in Africa we had uh, these um, insects that destroyed a significant area of the crops. How is that affecting our food system? So all these aspects need to be looked into. So, And food systems in Africa are ill-defined because uh, what we are seeing in Africa we have 
so many uh, and diverse food systems within and across countries and not approached in a holistic way. And these food systems are not dynamic, are not static. They are dynamic. We have seen transformation over the uh, years. And uh, this transformation has have come about from internal factors as well as external factors. And that's why we have seen major changes in nutritional status. Some of these are really related to what was happening in, uh, in the process of changing, uh, of food system changing in Africa. But again, food systems are highly susceptible to pandemic and epidemics. This is for plants, animals, and humans. And what we are seeing right now is this issue of COVID-19 that has really uh, created a lot of havoc as far as food systems in Africa are concerned. But when we talk of food system in Africa, it's not about, just about food. Then we have image for production and processing and food preparation. We have water scarcity. We have limited skills and knowledge in all element, elements of food system. Health system, which are weak in Africa to be able to respond to challenges presented by changes in food systems and uh, nutrition status, as pointed out in the uh, presentation by, uh, by Marco. So uh, what should be done? I think we need adequate description of food systems in Africa to explain what it means for various actors. What is a food system for agriculture, economists, politicians, or even military persons? whose focus is on the use of weapons, uh, even when there's, a no, there's no war, but they are participants of a food system. So how can we put them into the picture? Uh, so this is critical so that there's a collective understanding of food system and action at the end of the day. Awareness about the complex nature of food systems to ensure that every stakeholder, is, every stakeholder is aware about what is going on. But it should be noted that food systems, as I've already said, they are not static, they evolved over time, and they change from location to location, rural to urban, and between season, you see there's slight change in a food system. So that is very uh, important that definitions should also take cognizance of this fact. And then we have investment in education to meet human skill needs that uh, we all need to ensure that food system is sustainable. Because this is a new area. Uh, agricultural students in, in this continent are very few, uh, leave alone those doing food and other things. So I guess this is something that uh, need to be, needs to, to, to be done. So I'll stop here for now so that we allow men, more people to interact in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kinabo, for reflecting on the data and what Marco has presented. It strikes me that, um, you know, the reason that I thought this discussion would be great to have here is that um, Marco's very in-depth analysis has is sort of at a very global um, 30,000 feet level of how diets need to shift towards being more healthy and sustainable. And uh, all of your remarks, uh, Joyce, have been pointing out uh, the, the very ground level detailed granularity in, in food systems. And it's very complex. Um, as you said, uh, you know, guidelines or um, ideals for healthy diets, they need to be embedded in agricultural systems and in food systems, but all those systems are very, very different. So how, what are the different uh, actors that need to make that happen? So I think that's really pointed out, kind of the, the global vision, but then on the ground, what actually needs to be done uh, depends on many factors. I want to shift to a, um, a couple of rounds of questions from the chat box. So a lot of great questions have come in. <clears throat> and then if we have time uh, to 
have other people um, be able to intervene verbally and, and make uh, comments or questions. Um, there are a few, uh, a few technical questions for Marco. Um, so I'll read some of them that have come in. So Nesrian Boyko, I hope I said your name correctly, has asked, will the savings from shifting to healthier diets um, be larger than the cost of actually eating healthier diets? Um, and are, how do we connect the savings from the cost, which we discussed last week, which is already too expensive for many people to actually access healthy diets? Um, and so a related question is, who bears that cost of purchasing healthy diets? Because many poor people cannot right now. And who bears the cost of the health cost related to poor diets? Um, I think, Marco, that relates to these kind of, that many of the foods on the market are not accounting for their full costs of environment impact. Um, but if you could speak to that issue of kind of comparing who bears the cost and which is uh, larger between the, the market cost and the health cost to the society. And then in addition, there were some other detailed questions on costs. How were the health costs um, obtained? Are they at individual or household level? And that question was from Obaido and Elijah Obayelu. Um, Catherine Kilelu asked, it would be interesting if healthcare costs are also factored in to the cost of not seeking healthcare, which might be the case in low income countries. And uh, Yuri Hoberg asked, why is the rate of change from 2010 to 2030 larger for climate change compared to health costs? So I'll stop there at that round of question regarding um, specifically health costs. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for all those uh, questions. And also, uh, Joyce, I, I couldn't agree more with the comments you, you have made. And um, let me try to connect some of those uh, things. So briefly, the balance of savings and costs, I mean, as you saw, it depends what you look at, right? So in 2030, uh, according to our estimates, there could be as high as half of the wholesale costs. So if everything was included, so in high and middle income countries, usually healthy and sustainable diets already seem uh, uh, less costly. But if the external costs were to be included, um, then also uh, in low income countries by 2030, but surely by 2050 would be, uh, would be lower in costs. Um, who bears them? It's a very good question. Uh, it depends how the market is indeed regulated. So if there is proper regulation of the food system and, um, and uh, every item that has those unintended health or environmental uh, consequences for people carry that uh, price tag, then um, in a way, uh, probably those companies producing those foods bear uh, the cost because less people would buy those foods uh, if sort of people react according to uh, the price signal that they get, which of course uh, is not always the case. Uh, but also here, uh, policymakers have a role of uh, um, uh, creating a buffer that low income households can afford healthy and sustainable costs by, for example, uh, not only having that uh, cost adjust uh, um, uh, by basically um, having tax systems that give revenue that can be used for supporting low income households. The health costs are related to cost of illness estimates. And this I can connect to what uh, Joyce mentioned before, how the data is in low income countries. So um, all the uh, stuff we do is based on the, uh, at the country level. So we have data for 150, 160 countries. And in all those countries, we did uh, the analysis that I presented to you, the, the, the aggregate results of. So if you're interested in looking at results for your country, uh, write to me, look at the supplementary information. It's usually, uh, I try to always put it out there so people can use it. Um, the uh, Joyce was completely right that for low income countries, the data is much less uh, uh, much less good. I mean, for consumption, we have either dietary guidelines or uh, food availability, uh, availability data. So they give us some guess on what people eat. 
Um, but um, everybody will tell you, we fundamentally don't know what people eat nowhere in the world, you know. Uh, so we only can make an informed guess uh, that hopefully uh, is somewhere in the middle between those dietary surveys, which usually under report uh, and availability data, which usually over reports because of uh, inclusion of waste. Um, the cost of illness estimates are even murkier. So um, they are mostly based on fairly detailed data in high income countries. And what people do then is they try to translate what the, a similar price, uh, a similar cost of treating that illness would be in low income countries or middle income countries based on differences in healthcare expenditure, uh, of which there are statistics, and based on difference in uh, income. Um, I think that is not a bad way of doing it, but uh, um, it only gives you the general direction of travel really, right? So that is important to keep in mind. Um, for that, it's also important to keep in mind why the projections of health, uh, climate change costs rise faster than healthcare costs. And here, that is exactly because the projections of healthcare expenditure, uh, given what we think GDP will be in the future, will be relatively less uh, drastic than uh, the impacts of climate change in the future. Um, you probably have heard that the climate change has this like really long run-up cost uh, or run-up and then uh, you know in 2050 if we don't do anything we're, we really uh, uh, slam uh, uh, get a big slap uh, with suddenly super high uh, uh, climate change impacts. So those are really sort of uh, exponential and that is why you see also a much higher increase in the cost of climate change. Um, if I can briefly make a comment also on the dietary guidelines, if that's uh, okay, or um, I, I think I can connect it to some other points that were raised because people ask about what are the nutritional implications and, and so on. Um, and I think here it's important to keep in, uh, so in, in the dietary guidelines piece, we analyzed the whole range of dietary uh, patterns similar to what I showed you here. And I think the point is um, um, it doesn't need to be prescriptive, right? Uh, it's good to have multiple options of what you can recommend to people and not everybody needs to eat the same diet, but we need to have some idea of what sort of the maximum unhealthy or unsustainable diet is that we are prepared to recommend to people. And based on our analysis, we found that, for example, if you were to eat uh, more than one serving of red meat per week or have more than one serving of dairy and milk per uh, or milk per day then it will be very hard if everybody adhere to that diet to stay within the environmental limits that we have on this planet um, so that gives sort of an upper upper bound but as uh, how much more plant-based you want to go um, um, that can be up to you, right? You can properly, if you have a well-composed plant-based diet, increase the health benefits and be also more sustainable when you look at climate change, for example. But um, I think the, the thing is to look at uh, really a, a set of options. Um, and we did also full nutritional analysis on all of those. And many dietetic societies have come out and said that uh, even fully plant-based diets are appropriate for all life courses. So uh, if you guys are interested, just check the uh, American Dietetic Society's um, position statement. The Italian Dietetic Society has, something, has said something very similar. And most dietetic societies are now coming out in support of plant-based uh, diets. Uh, sometimes you obviously need some supplementation in high risk groups, right? So um, I don't want to carry that under the carpet. So, but if you're interested, check out the Dietetic Society statements. Um, and was there anything more? Ah, yeah. So I think what is what was also important is that if you have uh, dietary guidelines or analysis like I presented. Um, of course, uh, uh, change doesn't come from nowhere, right? Um, and I mean, we, we estimated in the guidelines piece that if uh, policies were successful in shifting diets at a population level, then uh, if you value those, um, uh, just those uh, health benefits um, with standard measures of cost benefit analysis, those are slightly different than the uh, sort of more market-based valuations that I showed you here. But if you use what is very often done in sort of policy assessments, then you find savings, uh, you, you'll find a value of 10 to 20% of uh, GDP in countries if people were uh, uh, actually shifting their diets just based on 
the health benefits. Uh, so there is a huge untapped, uh, untapped, untapped uh, potential to um, also to tell to policymakers take diets and what people eat and what is grown in the country seriously and not only in terms of just ever producing more whatever it is but in terms of looking what is a healthy and sustainable combinations of foods that is both consumed and produced and that obviously needs champions local champions to do that uh, to, to make that argument and to make sure that um, the change that is always happening in a culture is uh, steered in a healthy and sustainable direction instead of just left purely to the market that might be controlled either by you know crony politicians or food uh, the food companies that want to make a buck right so I think it makes much more sense to look at it from aspects that actually benefit people like a healthy environment and uh, uh, good health uh, in general um, than than leaving it up to uh, whoever really so um, uh, yeah so for my comments, maybe we can take more uh, more questions as well. Thanks very much, Marco. Yeah, I really, um, I, I totally uh, agree with you about, um, you know, we need to get the vision right and that there's latitude within that vision. But uh, there's, you know, at least from the interest of public benefit, there needs to be, uh, um, you know, a vision that moves people towards what is healthy for all and sustainable for all, um, which is not being, uh, the market is not guiding very well at, at the moment. Um, we are at the hour and our hosts have kindly agreed to stay on another 15 minutes for additional questions. Um, uh, we recognize that some people may have other plans and need to go and the, re the recording will be available. Uh, but for those who are um, interested to stay on for uh, some additional questions, we can do that now. Um, if you would like to make a comment, uh, please either say so in the chat box or raise your hand. And while we are tallying those people who do have raised hands, I'll just uh, do one more set of hopefully brief questions. Um, and there's one that came from Laïs uh, Miachon, which is asking somewhat related to what you were uh, talking about, um, Marco, but she's asking a specific question. Is there a scenario uh, that was modeled that includes animal source foods but reduces dairy, uh, something that's more closely related to consumption patterns seen in many parts of Asia? And then there is an additional question from uh, Jazia Steinmetz on impacts on biodiversity. So you presented a lot about uh, greenhouse gases. Um, is, there, uh, is there an impact that we can talk about regarding biodiversity and the loss of the heritage of um, indigenous plants and trees in, and species? So we'll start with that and then move to any raised hands. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent questions again. Um, so in our diet scenarios, we only included those that we found are uh, sort of can stay within the global environmental limits of the food system. And those were, uh, the maximum one was this flexitarian one that has reductions both, both in uh, meat and in dairy compared to current diets uh, on average, right? So that might be that in uh, a specific Asian country, where let's say meat consumption um, is relatively lower then um, uh, uh, then the reduction would be uh, no where dairy so where dairy is lower then uh, there might only be a reduction in meat but not in dairy so for example um, uh, uh, we didn't um, if something was a maximum recommendation um, um, and you shouldn't have more than x but you had less than X, uh, we didn't move uh, populations to, uh, to that maximum point. So you could basically over fulfill any recommendation. Um, and yeah, in every country that is very different. So I can again encourage you to check through um, the spreadsheets that we have in our analysis to see what the necessary dietary change would be in the countries you're interested in uh, for those different diet scenarios. Um, um, and 
obviously there might be other ones but those are the, this are, those are suggested dietary patterns but one can think about all kinds of different ones as well um <clears throat> now we found the wiggle room is actually surprisingly small so if you had two servings of red meat per day uh, per week that wouldn't do if you had uh, a lot more uh, double the amount of dairy uh, that wouldn't do probably you could reduce a bit meat and move up dairy a little bit uh, so there is some wiggle room but um, um, uh, uh, in general wiggle room is small it seems uh, when we if we take the environment seriously the second question on biodiversity uh, yeah it's a very good one as well and a very tricky one so nobody really has a good idea how to properly value biodiversity so there are a couple of approaches one is called the ecosystem service approach where you look at what kind of ecosystem services are provided by let's say a forest, a mangrove, uh, in terms of you know, recycling water, cleaning water. Uh, with forests, you can do that also with uh, basically sequestering carbon. There are other approaches that lo look at the use factor, how much would companies make if you knock down that forest? And the other idea is if you would actually make sure that uh, the cost of knocking down that forest is larger than what a company would obtain from using the products of the forest, then they wouldn't knock it down, right? So that is sort of an opportunity cost approach. Um, it's very hard to do that on a global basis, on, on a local level where you can map ecosystems and different kinds of either ecosystem services or different kinds of vegetation uh, and, uh, and different uh, sets of uh, animals. Um, there you can do something, but global analysis are a little bit far, far and uh, in between. Um, but there is a rich literature on biodiversity in general uh, and a smaller literature on valuing that. Excellent, thank you. Um, and as you see in the chat box, everyone, there's, uh, Cecilia has been providing um, instructions if you do wish to raise your hand, um, or if we haven't seen it, just note that in the chat box. Um, there have also been a couple of, of more questions, which um, maybe Joyce, you could comment on, uh, as well as Marco, that deal with um, kind of the, the, uh, the settings in, uh, in Africa and in other parts of the world, maybe that aren't captured by the data that is being analyzed on uh, costs and emissions. Um, that sort of falls out uh, outside the margins, which are um, indigenous foods. So uh, Dele Rahim asked, uh, what about accounting for indigenous foods as opposed to uh, imported processed foods or those for sale in terms of health and the environment? And um, then another question is regarding the, um, the specifics of the situation and how it relates to healthy and sustainable food production and diets from Jennifer Karsner, um, just pointing out that reducing animal source food consumption when the population eats more than uh, needed makes sense, but in areas uh, where stunting is prevalent and cognitive deficiencies and, and malnutrition, undernutrition in general, um, is that really the best message to reduce animal source food consumption. Um, so maybe Joyce, Joyce, you might have some comments regarding the kind of indigenous or underutilized foods in this sort of discussion, as well as animal source foods in contexts where they're really not consumed. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay, as the um, person who posed the question wanted the um, situation specific kind of um, response uh, is true um, the message design sometimes can have uh, some implications as to what it means for someone who is not eating that kind of food and suddenly the message say it is reduce intake of uh, a certain food uh, and that's why I think Mark has come up with uh, these different diets. And I also mentioned that we need to come with a hypothetical kind of diet that would make people adjust their eating. If we don't tell them how much they should eat per day, per week, then it becomes very difficult to make decisions as to uh, 
you know, psychology of eating is very significant. Uh, I'm used to eat meat and I want to eat meat. I cannot eat anything except meat. So people go for meat. But then the messaging should be proper and adequate that, okay, for intake of meat, you only need to eat this amount per day, per week. And everybody, those who do not eat at all and those who are eating a lot, should strive to get to that level of consumption. So reducing, increasing, these are not very good words in terms of messaging. When you say reduce and increase, uh, even someone in the US may think that what they are eating is not enough. So they might increase because the message is saying increase. So to avoid such words, I think, we've come to a level with this analysis that Marco is bringing up. I mean, we, we should be able to say exactly what we mean by that message. So um, I guess I think uh, this is uh, something that uh, can be worked out. Uh, in terms of indigenous foods, I don't know how much Marco has included these, uh, uh, these foods. There are foods that, uh, because not, not all populations access food through the market. There are certain foods that are obtained in different ways. So in the analysis that has been done, I don't know how much this has been considered, but indigenous foods, wild plants, wild animals, I, I don't know how much information do we have with regard to contribution to carbon emission and contribution to nutrition in terms of nutrient. So uh, indigenous foods, I think, need, need, uh, needs to, need to be included in the analysis. But obviously, these are not consumed in the areas where the analysis are done. And the data on the availability, production, consumption of this is also tricky. We cannot get that information. So if there are uh, people out there who have that information, I think they can share so that the analysis can be done properly, adequately to capture some of these uh, aspects. Thank you. Great, yeah, certainly uh, environmental impact can, can vary a lot by the specific micro system. But um, uh, Marco, if you would like to make a very brief clarification about that point, and then we will move to a hand that has been raised. Sure, uh, yeah, on indigenous foods, there is very little data, uh, so we couldn't include that. Um, we used for consumption data, uh, the data provided by the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, most of the time, I don't think they include any of those. Our health analysis is based on very broad risk factors though. So it's fruits in general, vegetables in general, and so on. So uh, their indigenous foods can of course make a valuable contribution. With LCAs, well, you can say you find those foods and therefore they don't have an impact. But then if everybody finds those foods, then again, they become actually a produced food that also have inputs uh, or that need inputs to be produced at scale. So um, I would be surprised if, um, uh, even including them would make a very big difference for the moment because if they would be more important then they wouldn't be those found foods anymore. Um, and the comment on animal source foods and cognitive deficiency and stunting, uh, I mentioned before for, uh, uh, that depends on the specific nutrients in a diet and also um, diets without animal source foods ha can have all of those uh, and very often it's a, more a matter of eating enough calories to prevent uh, stunting, for example. Um, so th there's no problem of that. Uh, but as I said, you don't need to recommend that people completely uh, leave out an any animal source food, but it's about the context specific level that you ask people to maybe keep in mind that they shouldn't be more than this, but they can be lower if they, uh, if they uh, at the same time eat more fruits and vegetables, for example. Thank you, Marco. We do have um, a person, a couple of people who have raised their hand. Um, we have Mr. Waldi Johannes. Yes. If you can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate for Marco for his nice presentation. Uh, 
My concern is, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I realized that uh, most of the food items that are listed in his presentation are are really on cereals, meat, vegetables, fish, and so on. I wonder that if you think about uh, cooking supplements like edible oil, which is a very uh, important part of foods, but which ir- may, if I'm not mistaken, it's not that much address. But if I realized that most of uh, the rural people, especially even in the urban areas, are using poor quality oil, which is a, a critical issue for health aspects. And so have you ever uh, touched on this aspect, especially for edible oil, poor edible oil, because they are very, very uh, uh, critical, especially in coronary heart diseases. And uh, I actually face such challenges in my country, Ethiopia. And of course, I have seen some information in other Africa country as well. So could you give, uh, have you touched on these aspects as well uh, for Marco? Thank you very yeah. much. Thank, thanks, thanks a lot for the question. Uh, very good question. Um, we have done some analysis in that uh, BMJ paper on dietary guidelines that also include uh, different oils. Um, in general, we always include different oils in environmental analysis because we know that, for example, palm oil has a much higher impact on uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions than uh, non-palm oil because of the land use changes and the way that is harvested. Um, from the health perspective, what is known for sure is that if you switch um, from saturated fats to unsaturated fats, then that is usually uh, associated with an improvement in risks for, for example, coronary heart disease. And the switch the other way around if you have oils that are higher in saturated fats like palm oil or coconut oil or animal source foods then uh, that is usually uh, associated with increase in risk for most diets if you compare it to changes in other dietary risk factors like eating more fruits and vegetables reducing red and processed meat in general eating more legumes uh, then the uh, actual impact of that uh, change in fatty acid composition is relatively small I'm not saying that it's not important. It can truly make a contribution, but um, uh, if you look at it from the overall perspective within diet, so I would say yes, uh, by all means, for uh, include it in any anything, but also think about changes in other risk factors. Thank you. We have one more person who has raised uh, his hand, and is John Louis de la Vega, and I have. I will unmute you. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the food-based dietary guidelines. And uh, actually, you've said a while ago that some of the food-based dietary guidelines does not include uh, sustainability. So what are the specific steps or uh, procedures or I think, uh, yeah, uh, what are the specific te- steps that we can take or we can employ to actually include sustainability as one of the factors uh, in making uh, food-based dietary guidelines? Thanks. Thank yeah, you. Ex- thanks a lot. That's an excellent question as well. So the number one thing that we found that holds national dietary guidelines from being uh, in line with global environmental targets is the recommendation on meat and dairy because most guidelines shy away from having proper, uh, proper target values in there. They might sometimes say eat less or so, or uh, don't eat more than once a day, but once a day of uh, red meat, for example, would be way too high, right? Uh, for, I mean, both for your health, but also for uh, environmental aspects, since red meat includes both pork and beef, and beef in particular is associated with high impacts. Uh, but also the dairy recommendations are usually off the roof. So they include way more than the one serving per day that would be globally sustainable. Um, and um, yeah, so having more progressive recommendations on animal source foods uh, is really important uh, and really making clear what a good upper limit is, right? Um, obviously, people can have less. Uh, and that is also not very clearly stated in guidelines. So sometimes it's Uh, as if everybody has to eat a a certain amount of meat. But as we know, I think that doesn't need to be the case. So there need to be good examples of 
uh, well composed, more plant based diets as well. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think those are really the number one things. Funny enough, uh, in lots of low income countries, the recommendations are actually very low on animal source foods, and they tend to be a bit more in line with the environmental targets. But often they could still improve on the health bit a bit because they might not include very high targets for uh, nutritious plant-based foods like uh, legumes and nuts or so because probably in the food systems uh, um, they're they not so easily accessible, right? So um, there the question is really um, uh, keeping at the sort of moderate intake level for animal source foods but making sure that uh, the supply of healthy and nutritious plant-based uh, foods uh, is increased. Can I just comment on that uh, question, uh, the issue of sustainability? I don't know uh, if we really want to make this food-based dietary guidelines sustainable or uh, do we feel that they need to be dynamic sort of because mm. things are changing and uh, changing very fast in terms of diet. So when you talk of sustainable, uh, is it about the message? Is it about the guidelines or is it about um, the entire approach of doing things to get really uh, sustainable diets? And uh, I'm a bit worried in the use of this word sustainable. Uh, if you say a sustainable diet, is, is it the diet that we come up should stay on forever or what is it? I think this is where people are getting problems. So if you could clarify more on that, it would be very, very helpful. Oh. Yeah, that's a, that's a great comment. Uh, I mean, what I was talking about was mostly environmental sustainability. So there the idea is that we something shouldn't be recommended if it's not in line with global environmental targets and environmental limits. Uh, but obviously also the process of developing dietary guidelines needs to be in a way sustainable, right? Uh, so having a process by which guidelines are updated regularly are based on scientific evidence. Uh, every so often things do change a bit. Uh, we might have better and better understanding of the environmental and health impacts five years down the road. So it's important to bake that into the process of generating national dietary guidelines. Um, and I, I think the, and, 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 but the message is also very important as you highlight. And some uh, Nordic countries, for example, have uh, uh, on the, uh, on, at face validity sort of included sustainability aspects in their guidelines. But for them, the message is uh, just eat local. But we know that it makes hardly any uh, difference for sustainability because transport emissions are very low compared to uh, the emissions that uh, are generated on a, um, at the farm. So um, sometimes people say sustainable, but what they actually recommend, especially when it's policymakers, is far, uh, far from uh, environmentally sustainable. Thanks, Marco and, and Joyce. And, um... I'd like to close the session now. We've had so many good comments and a lot of great discussion, which uh, I really appreciate um, both the presenters and the participants for this discussion. And I think, you know, what we're coming away with here is um, greater clarity on thinking about, you know, food systems that support recommendations, recommendations that support human health alongside global environmental health, which of course supports human health over the long term. Uh, so, you know, not discounting the long term costs for future generations uh, to be able to eat healthy diets as well. Uh, so it's, it's an important time to be discussing this. Once again, I'm you know, very pleased that these aspects of, um, of cost, health, and sustainability have been considered at such a high level within the UN state of food security and nutrition in the world. And there's a lot of work to be done, clearly, on making food systems that, um, that do work for people on the planet. Um, this has been a very uh, 
helpful discussion and it will be available online with the related resources. We'll pass around the link once uh, the kind people at ANH Academy have uploaded it onto the website. Um, so, so thank you all for joining and, and thanks once again for our uh, tremendous speakers today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Anna. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a nice day. You as well. Thank you. I'm going to sleep now. <laughs> Lala Salama. Asante, asante. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you so much.